Good evening and welcome to tonight's Melbourne Symphony Orchestra event, both to our audience here in the Iwaki Auditorium and to all of you watching on YouTube. My name is Ben Northey, I'm the Associate Conductor of the MSO. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to the elders from other nations present or watching this event. Tonight we are exploring Umarella, a war requiem for peace, one week before it is performed as part of MSO's Education Week. Umarella brings into focus a period of Australia's history that is yet to be fully understood. Written and composed by acclaimed Yorta Yorta soprano composer and artistic director of short black opera Deborah Cheatham, this work explores the Umarella resistance wars and will be sung entirely in the dialects of Gundichimara language. Tonight I'm going to be joined by Deborah Cheatham to talk about her life and the extraordinary journey she has been on to create Umarella. We're also going to be joined by Vicky Cousins, Gundichimara language custodian, and she's going to be talking about her translation of the Umarella text. And Deborah and I will be joined by an ensemble of musicians and singers to perform some extracts from this extraordinary work live here in Iwaki Auditorium. We also want to hear from you. So please send us your comments or questions on YouTube and hopefully we'll be able to read some of those out later. But I thought we'd start with some music from you, Morella. To perform an excerpt from you, Morella, would you please welcome the musicians of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, singers from Short Black Opera and the Consort of Melbourne and our composer and soprano, Deborah Cheatham.
Thank you. Should we let the musicians have a rest? We'll go and take our uh, position here at this cocktail lounge they've organised for us. Doesn't look like there's any gin and tonics here, I'm afraid, Deborah. But oh, no one will be able to sleep after that imperfect cadence there. You'll be left <laughs> hanging. Unexpected ending. Well, the work, of course, goes for much longer uh, than the little excerpt that we performed. But just on behalf of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and everybody here tonight, I would like to thank you for joining us. It's a great honour to have you here and to be collaborating on this project and something as meaningful as you, Marella. It's one of the most significant projects that I've been involved with the, with the orchestra over 17 years here. Thank you. And we just heard what was the first movement of you, Marella, or part of the first movement, uh, in its chamber version. But before we talk about that, I'd like to ask some questions about you more broadly and your own musical journey. Sure. Because your career as a musician is wonderfully varied and diverse, and at the risk of giving you a very broad canvas, how did it all begin for you with music? It all began with uh, a wonderful, my formal training all began with a wonderful music teacher when I was in high school. I have her to thank for all of my early development, the potential that she saw in me, the opportunities that I was afforded. And I think they are the great unsung heroes at times of our nation, are uh, the music teachers. They work very hard. And uh, I know this, I, I was inspired by my music teacher, Jennifer King, to become a music teacher myself. That was my career for some 20 years. But before that, Ben, I have to say, singing actually is my earliest memory. And um, I think music has been threaded through my life and, uh, and has informed who I am for a very long time. And what about composition? How did you make this... Uh transition from your involvement in music <laughs> and uh, of course a, a, a trained opera singer I mm. should point out as well as you can hear it's, uh, it's wonderful to have the composer as performer in this work but the, the, the journey into composition so tell me about that. Yes I could use my soprano voice for the answer to the questions <laughs> but I won't alarm you with all of that. It's interesting, you know, I've, as I mentioned before, I've worked with children for a very long time. Uh, I was a high school music teacher for some 20 years and, um, and had m my own children, my own family, and ch children compose all the time. You have children, I'm sure it's the same at home. Yeah. Your children just are singing constantly their own world, their own little universe in song. And this, this connects us back to a very uh, deep way of knowing the world that traditional cultures have remained connected to for a very long time. And of course, here in Australia, where we celebrate the longest continuing culture in the world, we've been singing our knowledge for something like 2,000 generations. So I guess it was always there. The formalisation of, of me as a composer, gosh... Even after I'd written Pecan Summer, which is some 10 years ago now, in fact, next year we'll ce celebrate 10 years since Pecan Summer premiered on country in Marupna. Even after I'd written my first opera, I still didn't want to add composer to my little signature on the end of my email. I just, I didn't know whether I'd earned that title. I just knew that I needed to write that music. But I guess in the ensuing 10 years, uh, more and more work in terms of composition has come along. I trained uh, at the Sydney Conservatorium as, as a music teacher, actually, Bachelor of Music Education. And uh, I was an okay harmony student, but I always liked to write. I always liked to capture that moment uh, because what I do as a soprano, it's so um, ephemeral, you know. Uh, you can't, what well, you can record, but that live moment, how do you hold on to that? And so to write music down was a really logical process, uh, progression for me. Well, I congratulate you on making that. It doesn't sound like it was a decision, really. It sounds more like it was a calling for you. Uh, absolutely. To have to, have to write, to have absolutely. to express yourself through that medium of, of composition. It's a great learning curve at my, this, my stage of, uh, this stage of my career mm. to be uh, continually trying to push the boundaries of my own understanding as a composer and um, I've had some wonderful opportunities this year to premiere some works with fabulous groups like Plexus, uh, uh, Melbourne based groups, Plexus, Rubik's Collective and, and, and write new music, bringing that together with various indigenous languages. Um, it's, it's great to challenge yourself as a musician 
throughout your career, and I guess that's it was uh, unexpected, but I think calling is a great word. Mm. Yeah. Well, speaking of challenges, this has been a big undertaking for you. Mm. We should uh, talk about you, Morella. Tell us what this piece is essentially about, and perhaps the story of the process of, of development. Well, I'm glad that you gave it its full title at the beginning of the talk tonight. Uh, you, Morella, a war requiem for peace. I first encountered the Umarella War story uh, in 2013. I was down on Gunditjmara country at the Lake Kondar mission and I was there with a senior elder of the Gunditjmara people, Uncle Ken Saunders. And uh, I could feel a restlessness in that land. Now I felt it elsewhere on lots of occasions but <laughs> nowhere near as intense as it was down there. I talk about this, and you may have heard me talk about this before or read, where I speak about this line of trees that's behind the old mission. And it's like there's a shout that comes out of that line of trees. There's like an uneasiness to that place that is a vibration that just goes through you. And when I felt this and I explained to Uncle Ken what I was feeling, he said, well, I want to tell you, if you don't already know about the Umarella Wars. Now, I, I'm going to confess something right here. You might expect, as an Aboriginal woman, that I would have known everything about the Umarella Wars. You know, I'm the custodian, aren't I, of all Aboriginal things? No, of course not. But I didn't know. I, I knew hardly anything about them. And I've gone on this journey from not knowing about them really at all to writing this work, to understanding. Uh, it's, it's a big journey for all of us, I think, as Australians, that one from not knowing. And all the fear and the discomfort you feel about not knowing, to knowing, but then the essential step beyond that is understanding. And I think that's what music helps to do. So I decided I would write a, a work in response to the history that Uncle Ken shared with me, the research that I did, the feeling that I got out of that land. And although I think un Uncle Ken would have loved me to write an opera because he just uh, he came along to see Pecan Summer in our third season on Garna Country there in Adelaide. It was 2014 by then and he said to me, look, I'd like you to write this story. Will you make it into an opera? And I just felt that we would reach more people if I could write this as a war requiem. Uh, I've taken inspiration, of course, from Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. Uh, in that he um, he went beyond the the Latin text that you may be familiar with. He went well mm. beyond that, incorporating the poetry of Wilfred Owen. Yes. And I felt that this was a medium that uh, that would reach a lot of people. And, and I love to write choral music. I just love it. Well, you do it very well too. Thank you. And this isn't the first time that the piece has been performed, although it will be in this in this context with yes. the larger forces, which we'll talk about. But it received its own country premiere as part of the Port Fairy Chamber Music Festival last year. Uh, but the version NSO we're performing next week is quite different. So what has changed from the, the chamber version to this version? Yes, this is the symphonic version. And uh, the intimacy of chamber music... Uh, there were still 50 people on stage, can I just say, for this chamber performance last year down in Port Ferry. Of course, Port Ferry being on Gunditjmara land. So very important to perform there. I think there'll be several main differences. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the, the size of the ensemble playing. You've seen the septet here this evening. Well, that expands out to the full symphony orchestra. Uh, in Port Ferry, we had... 12 members of the Consort of Melbourne. We just had four here this evening, although they sound like many more. Uh, we had the Dungala Children's Choir, who will return uh, uh, in um, next week for the uh, symphonic premiere. The three soloists, myself, Linda Barkan, mezzo-soprano, and Gungri baritone, Don Bemrose. So we've expanded the numbers. And somebody said to me, you know, in the process, is bigger better? And I said, it's different. It's it's going to allow for the audience to immerse themselves in a way that, especially in Hamer Hall, uh, in a different way to Port Ferry, where we were in the basketball court, and it was it was 
a great venue to perform on country, but I think to bring the sheer force of and the weight of the numbers that we will have on stage, the impact of the work, I think, will be definitely heightened. And something about the scale, uh, and you mentioned the Britain War Requiem before, which mm. calls for multiple choirs, yes. soloists, an enormous orchestra, uh, yeah, a children's choir off stage, uh, that, that seems to connect with the humanity of a War Requiem message of, of being able to tell that story. Absolutely. At, that's the word I was searching for, the scale. Mm. Uh, it does capture that message. We, we can't know exactly how many Gunditjmara uh, clans were living on that country before the wars began, but it was in the thousands of people, thousands. And at the end of that war, there were just 77. So it was a brutal war. And these wars were fought all across our continent. It's a part of our history that we're coming to know and I'm hoping this work will help people to understand understand the role that that non indigenous played and non indigenous people played in that war, that the indigenous people played in that war. I mean within me, on both I have two sides of my family, the Aboriginal side of my family, my mother, Yorta Yorta woman, my grandmother Yorta Yorta woman, her grandmother, Yorta Yorta woman and my grandfather a Ewan man. On the other side of my genealogy is my non-Indigenous father. It's very possible that within me, both sides of the war exists. And so I have had to find for myself a declaration of peace. This is what I'm hoping, and it's my intention that Umarala, this work, A War Requiem for Peace, offers that opportunity to Australians more generally. Yeah, and I, I just think that's a wonderful thing uh, that you've done and the fact that you, you have actually adapted the Requiem text. It's not a direct translation by any means. You've adapted the text, which has been then translated into Gunditjmara, which we'll talk about later. But you've actually told many aspects to this story, including the journey of the colonial settlers as well and their own, their own kind of struggles in, in uh, the you know, in that part of Victoria as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a part in the Requiem where I've I've said I've addressed uh, the, the 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 colonial settlers, uh, the invaders. <laughs> I've addressed them directly, and I've said, "You came such a long way only to ignore us. You endured such hardship only to overlook." what could have been a rich ab abundance of shared land. Uh, it was important for me to do that because I knew what would be on the other side of this. I knew the questions that would be raised by people who just can't believe they didn't know this history, who can't accept that they didn't know, who don't like to be in a position of not knowing. Um, when I was a teacher, I used to say to my kids all the time, there's no shame in not knowing but there is a problem if you can't be bothered to find out. So not knowing in itself is not a problem, but not bothering to find out. So I think that uh, when I began with the, with the Latin text, which of course I was familiar with uh, as a soprano, I've sung my share of Mozart, Fauré, Requiems, etc. But um, I got to the movement which is the Agnus Dei, Agnus Dei qui tollis peccata mundi, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And this iconography, this image in, in the Christian text is very important in the Christian faith and I understand that and I respect it. But I could not use that. When I knew that the Gunditjmara and many other nations across this continent had been murdered in order to put sheep onto their land, when I knew that it was the Gunditjmara who'd been sacrificed for the sheep, I, there was no way that I could use that, that literal translation. And I realised at that point that there would, be, there would be major points of departure in the text. I actually had gone to Banff in Canada, to the Banff Centre, to, uh, to begin work on, on Numerella. And uh, I was there when I I'd started to sit down with that text and... Uh, just goes to show you I hadn't thought of that until I came to it. So I do have an understanding of what it is to be an Australian that maybe you haven't thought about it yet. 
And now you are thinking about it. And what do you do with those thoughts and feelings that arise from those thoughts? So I am empathetic to the journey that I'm asking people to go on. I've been on it myself. Uh, and I feel that I did have licence because of the, because of the uh, Britain text that goes beyond the Requiem, that I could use that as scaffolding, if you like, and then expand the text to address uh, the ancestors, address those who fought on both sides of that war, the descendants as well, in the text, and provide this opportunity for a, declar a declaration of peace. Any conflict that Australians have fought in, you could name them, several of them right now if we ask the audience, at the end of each conflict, a declaration of peace. Mm. Even as flawed as some of them were, I'm thinking the Treaty of Versailles didn't do any favours and probably set up the Second World War. But here's the point. The declaration of peace is absent for Aboriginal people in these resistance wars. So what about a sung declaration of peace? What if you're in the audience and you are hearing 75 minutes of Gunditjmara language for the very first time? What does that do? What kind of vibration does that set up for you? Uh, these are interesting questions and for people who enjoy live performance and regularly come to Hamer Hall, I can guarantee you, you will not have heard, you will not have heard this particular uh, rhythmic language or this harmonic language because it's very much formed from the geography of Gunditjmara land. I wrote a lot of the original version, the chamber version, while I was down in Port Ferry um, on a residency last year, looking out at Bass Strait, looking out to an island of great significance to the Gunditjmara, uh, Dean Ma, it's known as, and realising that the Gunditjmara had sung their knowledge into that land for something like 2,000 generations. And all I had to do was stand still for long enough in a respectful way to receive it. And it's hard for us to stand still in this life that we lead in the 21st century. I understand that. But it's more necessary now, I think, than ever before. And this is where you can bring people into an auditorium like Hamer Hall or here at Awaki and you can give people an experience in a way a non-threatening experience that kind of comes with an RSVP. <laughs> here's the music, here's the invitation to know something you didn't know or understand it on a deeper level than you've understood it. And I think that's where music is vital in our culture. It, it can't ever be the thing you just do in between halves of football. It has to be right at the heart of knowing and carrying knowledge forward. Well, uh, I'm really thrilled to say that the concert is completely sold out. It is. <laughs> There's no tickets <laughs> left. No. We are filming uh, this concert and it will be uh, hopefully available to many, many more people beyond Absolutely. the concert hall experience as well. And I hope this gives you a, a great insight uh, into the power and the emotional power of, of a work like this. It's, in it, as we said, enormously large forces, not just the MSO, also the Melbourne Youth Orchestra. We've got young musicians sitting side by side with the MSO, the MSO Chorus, the Dungala Children's Choir, and of course our soloists, as Deborah mentioned. Uh, I, I think we've got a couple of minutes to chat left, but has that been a particular challenge, just logistically, on paper, wh when you were... Did you, you know, come up with that, with that uh, scale of the score, or, or was that something that was that was given to you? Uh, yes, the score, I decided that I would go with triple wins. Mm. That's a benchmark for people who are in the business. Uh, is it triple wins, they ask you? It's a big you? orchestra. Because it's, it's a big orchestra. Mm. I, I decided that if you're going to do something, then do it wholeheartedly. And, uh, and when you have, when someone throws you the keys to the Rolls Royce, well, make sure you fill it up with petrol. Absolutely. And so when I was invited to write for the MSO, I wanted to be as expansive as I could um, whilst being truthful to the piece, what really delighted me, really delighted me, was the uptake from the MSO chorus. I think uh, almost 100% of the chorus put their hand up to be in the work. Now, I don't know that we can fit everyone on stage, but everybody wanted to. And this is a really important 
uh, point to make that I very deliberately wrote this work for non-Indigenous choir. You know, we've got Dungala Children's Choir, there are Yorta Yorta and a Warawarang Choir mostly and some Gunditjmara children as well, myself and uh, Don Bemrose as Indigenous singers, but I wanted the main choir to always be non-Indigenous. We have to do this together and we can't always be the, just the audience, or well, not just the audience, but we can't always be the onlookers. We have to participate in it. And I couldn't think of any better way mm. than to ask the chorus to learn 75 minutes of Gundich Of language, yes. Well, that has been, uh, it's presented challenges, shall we just say. Well, it's, you <laughs> They've know, embraced those, though, I that, have to that, say. They certainly have. I mean, we started off with a conversation where they reassured me of all the languages they sing in, and it's formidable, you know, mm. Mandarin, I think. I said, but yeah, about, what, 20 billion people speak Mandarin. Uh, there's no one speaking the Gunditjmara dialects conversationally. Mm -hmm. But this work is going to help to change that Absolutely. situation. Absolutely. And remember, for those people watching online, we want to hear from you tonight, so please don't forget to send us your questions and comments on YouTube. And in a few moments, we're going to be talking with the Gunditjmara language custodian, Vicky Cousins. Uh, she's going to be joining us to talk about the, more about the Umarela text. But first, we're going to hear some more music, Deborah, another excerpt from you, Morella. Yes. And uh, while I'm getting ready, perhaps you can tell our audience a little bit about what they're going to hear now. I will. Someone didn't turn their phone off. I'll give you a moment, because everybody will be cross with you if you don't. There you go. So you're going to hear uh, the sixth movement, Taramik, Taramikini Yi. This is that line of trees, this is that vibration, this is that shout that comes at me every time I stand on the old Lake Kondar mission. And I realise that the people that survived the massacre of the convincing ground, who retreated back from the shoreline only to be met by water that had been poisoned ahead of their retreat, and they died when they, where they fell and no ceremony was afforded to them. These are the voices that shout at me, but I've captured it in such a way to, un to intensify that experience. It's not the bombastic beginning that you might expect, but this, this is that line of trees.
and grateful thanks to the wonderful singing of our members of our choir tonight and the musicians of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, who I thought we'd meet a couple of them now to talk a little bit about this project. Philip Arkenstall, our clarinetist, and Michelle Wood. Uh, would you please make them welcome as they work their way around to the front here, Philip and Michelle? So perhaps, Philip, firstly to you, uh, you performed in Umarella's On Country premiere in Port Ferry last year. Uh, what was your reaction to the work? Yeah, well, we were tired at the end of it. It's a long piece, and uh, it really doesn't let up <clears throat> emotionally. Mm. And I mean, it feels funny to talk in a room where Deborah has just spoken, to be honest, because when she speaks, she's speaking as someone that, like she said, can cross all cultures, really. And she's able to say things in a way which, when she sat down with me, I think she sat down with most of the group before we performed to talk us through the real deeper meaning behind her work. She found a way to say it that really resonated and uh, it was a kind of embarrassed amount of awakening that I underwent. And I think the audience that listened to that requiem, I mean, they were on their feet immediately, but they were equally shattered equally sort of opened their eyes of. Yeah, there's better ways of saying that, I'm sure. And, um, and she just raised the awareness of everybody without somehow managing to not point fingers, if you know what I mean. So yeah. this was just amazing, yeah. And Michelle, uh, as an MSO artist, why is it important for the orchestra to be performing a work like Umarella? Well, I think, I mean, it's been alluded to before, the, the word that keeps coming up is um, it has so much, so much meaning. And, I mean, I was also playing down in Port Ferry and it just struck me that if we as an organisation are going to be commissioning works, are going to be um, performing new works, the ones that really have the ability to communicate with the rest of the community and also the fact that we're working with young ensembles, with young singers from um, all over Victoria, it has so much meaning when there's all of us on stage and I'm so looking forward to next week for that reason because just knowing what that meant to me personally being down in Port Ferry for the On Country um, premiere, translating that to something bigger and to therefore know that the reach in some way will feel all the more profound I think as a, as a result. So I think for MSO to be linked to all of these, not only the educational aspect of it but also the new mu music aspect, the fact that you know we have this amazing musician and composer um, in Deborah who represents so many different parts of the community, both Indigenous, she's a female composer, but it goes beyond that. It's, I think, the meaning of the work that is the thing that resonated with me, and so I'm just glad that we're doing it on a bigger scale. It's so good to hear our musicians talking so proudly about one of our projects. Uh, would you please thank Philip and Michelle, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, so a third member of our panel has joined us. We are delighted to welcome the Gunditjmara language custodian, Vicky Cousins. Thank, Thank you, you very much for joining us, Vicky. Now, as we've been discussing, this work is entirely in Gunditjmara language. Can you tell our audience a little bit about the language and why its revival is so important? A little bit about the history of the language too, perhaps. Uh, yeah, Gunditjmara country is down from Warrnambool to the border, around in Hamilton, up that way. We have seven dialects within the language family. There's about 11 different language family groups in Victoria with over 44 languages within those families. Um, we have probably a few fluent speakers left in about two languages and Gunditjmara is being revived. Uh, my father set up uh, that program back in the 90s and um, this project with Deborah, this um, really important story has been a really catalyst moment within the whole journey because up until fairly recently we've been learning words but as, as Deborah pointed out we um, are unable to converse so I'm working on the grammar and this project really um, uh, we needed a lot of grammar building and um, to be able to translate the work. 
I can't imagine how complex it must have been because just talking to you even earlier today and knowing you know, far too little about Indigenous language, it gave me an insight into the complexities of the language and the fact that uh, there's a strong relationship between language and song in this, in this uh, region, isn't there as well? Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you think of language as the repository of your culture and your knowledge systems, and we're an oral tradition, so song and story uh, particularly ways of communicating and keeping that knowledge. Um, so it's really important for um, everybody to be able to learn, to be able to be fluent in speaking and singing. And I'm sorry, I lost the track of that one then. The, the, no, the song, uh, song being that incredible um, mm. repository for all of our knowledge and, and the way yeah. of knowing not only ourselves, but the geography of our landscape. Yeah, knowing our country. And it, it's so totally connected to who you are and where, where you're from and the knowledges that are stored within that, that language. So it's a whole world view. And without that, it, it's part of ourselves that needs restoring and, and filling up. And the, the world view then um, comes through in the words and the meanings and so translating some of the War Requiem for Peace was about even creating new words as well as grammar to put those words together. Well, that's right. You were, you were mentioning that some of the concepts trying to be conveyed in, for example, the Requiem Mass, they don't exist in Gundijamara culture, do they? I mean, this is some of these concepts you've had to adapt, you've had to find new ways to, to kind of speak well, about those ways things. to express mm. things because so it's not a matter of writing a sentence and then just finding Gunditjmara words to match that sentence. It's how we speak, the, the sentence order, the, the way that things are expressed. Mm. And um, we were fortunate we did have words for lamb because we had contact language where we'd already created new words, to but, me. pardon? To kill me. Mm. To kill me. In, in that, um, uh, in that Unused Day movement, actually, there's a word that I've used, the word sacrificed, but I know that that's not a word that, that you were using in Gunditjmara. I think the literal translation was totally got rid of. Uh, so there are some words or concepts that just were not there yeah. for lots of different reasons. Yeah, so, some of which is that the, you know, we don't have a full vocabulary recorded, we don't have a full grammar, so mm. sometimes we have to create new words or borrow them from neighbouring languages. There's a whole lot of different processes that had to, had, we had to go through and I had, I couldn't do it, I'm not an um, academically trained <laughs> linguist, however I work with uh, Dr Chris Travis Ira, who um, is the person that supports me in the translating process, particularly around the linguistics and applying linguistics um, to building the language again. We're so lucky to have you uh, having worked on this project with Deborah. I think it's one of the things that makes Umarella so powerful is the fact that you have essentially an adaptation of the Requiem, a retelling in, in some cases, but uh, having it in language makes it just speak so much more directly. Why do you think it was so important to make that decision? To, to translate it into Gunditjmara language? Uh, it, was, it was never even really a decision. It was always going to have to come from the voice of the Gunditjmara people, their story. But uh, in using the Requiem Mass, which is a form that would be familiar to many audiences, it's just employing an old um, you know, educational principle to work from the known to the unknown. And so even for great choirs of the world who'll sing this, beginning with uh, Consort of Melbourne last year and uh, MSO Chorus this year, uh, we'll find a kind of ease around the process because, oh yes, this is a structure that we know. And so you're not just diving straight into something that is a completely foreign world to you. Uh, I knew when I asked Vicky, you didn't even hesitate. I don't even think I finished the sentence of asking you and you said yes. And, and then, I sent this, then I sent the lyrics to you, <laughs> it was pages and pages. 
but um, there was always going to be the undiluted Gunditjmara voice in this. Now, I'm not Gunditjmara, I'm Yorta Yorta woman, so to be entrusted with this is such a privilege that I can't begin to tell you uh, what it was to be entrusted with the story right from leadership and those co early conversations with Uncle Ken, but mm. in particular when Travis and um, Vicky delivered to me the translation, the first draft of the translation, mm. I had tears in my eyes I, to, to see it realised in that way, in that physical way, that something that we can always hold on to, something we can refer to. Uh, and that's something that's as valid as any concert you go along to with the words in German or Latin or Italian or whatever else. We have always been a multicultural nation on this continent. Many languages, many mm. customs, many cultures. And this brings together a couple of dialects, isn't it, Vicky? We uh, should, seven. Yeah, seven, seven. dialects from the, from the Gunditjmara lands, which I like to say are basically the size of Poland, but it's probably a little bit bigger. It's a very large country down there. Why do you think, Vicky, uh, there is so little access to Indigenous language in Australia? Why, why is it that uh, we don't incorporate it into our learnings, uh, that people can go through their entire lives not knowing any Indigenous language outside of place names? Um, how is that possible at the risk of opening a very big Pandora's box? Well, it is a big Pandora's box, and I think the, um, the things that Deborah said earlier in framing that we're moving from the no unknown to the no to knowing and um, I think to coin or uh, use a phrase that Jen Greaves used is the violence of denial which is this is part of that story in that we, we don't want to know and De Deborah talked about the bothering to know and and we're coming into that time and uh, I think we are in what I call a new dreaming story there's a new energy, people do want to know. It's a time of sharing. Our old people have been waiting for so long and this, this is a brilliant and uh, very expansive um, gesture um, that Deborah has brought as an offering to all of us. And um, it is, it's been a great privilege for me and uh, to continue the work of my dad, but this also was unknown to me because I really don't know much about classical music or operas or requiems for that matter. And I didn't hesitate because I love working in language and when Deborah said, do you want to do it? Yes. And then I got it and I'm looking for the words and I'm going, oh, what about the words and how will I do this? And oh, look at all this. And, and it was actually Travis who educated me on the poetry and beauty of and the significance of what Deborah had done once, and once I'd calmed down and began to understand it, in bringing that and bringing the voices and the participation, what you talked about, Deborah, which is so important. In, in Port Ferry, what effect did it have on you at the end of the performance? I, I must, I, I can only imagine that must have been such a profound moment for you Absolutely, personally. Absolutely, because the, the country that we're talking about is my grandmother's country mm. and we lived over Warrnambool, which is my grandf grandfather's country, so having the mob come over, you know, and we're there together and hearing that and there was a whole lot of things, the story, the, the bringing of peace to the country, you know, that's a beginning, it's a start of that journey to see the beautiful, you know, performance and the, the aunties and elders that were there mm. and then the kids, the children. Mm. Yeah. Isn't it just wonderful? And, yeah. yeah. It's that just also amazing. sold out that performance and I yeah. remember um, <laughs> the festival organiser in Grandage hiring more chairs from Warrnambool because people just didn't want to stay on the waiting list. It was very exciting and that what was exciting, it's gratifying obviously as the composer, but what is very exciting is the appetite that Australia has. And I, I, don't let anybody tell you that Australia isn't ready for this. We are mm. ready for this. We want it. And um, the naysayers might be louder, but they're fewer, I believe. Yeah. And uh, we have to have the difficult conversations. And 
being able to take a neighbour or a friend or even a family member along to a concert and say, well, experience this, the truth of this, is, is one way of opening up that conversation. Yeah. Well, we're going to be hearing another piece of music in a moment, but would you please thank Vicky Cousins, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Stay there, Vicky. Stay there. And uh, I should also say congratulations to you for the extraordinary work that you've done on this and, and to say thank you. We can't wait to bring it to life again next week. We're going to perform one more excerpt from Umarella Deborah. Can you tell our audience a bit about what we're going to perform? Well, I'm, I'm going to put Vicky on the spot here. We're going to perform the Lakawanum. Mm -hmm. would, you read, would you read out the, so that we can actually the hear? First. Yeah, just right. those three lines there. Okay, Pang Nuch and Nuch, Nyanya Lakawanu, Nara Pratekata Kuiawanu. I can all, I can guarantee that it's been a very long time since a Gundishmara woman has stood on this land and spoken her own language in such a large gathering. But it would have happened because the trade between the Bunwarang and the Gundishmara and right up into my country. Yorta Yorta country was long established and uh, it's just great to have the voice of authority there speaking your own language, speaking those words. Thank you. It's a difficult movement that we're going to leave you with, um, an inconvenient truth I suppose, but the translation of the words that Vicky just spoke. What could we say? To which protector could we appeal when even the child was not safe? Well, Deborah, I'll let you uh, go and get ready for the performance, but uh, it nearly brings us to the end of tonight's events uh, here at the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra in Iwaki Auditorium. We have had some great comments on YouTube. I'll read one of them out. It's from Don Bembrose. Deborah, you'll be uh, happy to hear from Don, who is going to be one of our soloists in Umarella. And he says, quote, glad to be able to virtually attend this evening. I'm looking forward to singing with you again next week. Uh, so lovely message from Don. And Don, we are looking forward to performing with you as well. Uh, a huge thank you to all of our performers, uh, to Vicky and, of course, to Deborah. And as Deborah said, we're going to leave you tonight with one final excerpt from Umarella, Quid Sum Misa, Nyangya Laka Wanung. Thank you for joining us and good night.